Okay, I think we've got a stable number, so I'm going to get us started. And as people will probably be joining as we get going. So first of all, welcome everybody to today's event. It's called Go Global Public Investment, A Better Way to Finance the SDGs. I'm Harpinda Collicott. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Development Initiatives, an organization that enables actions through data, evidence, and insight. Today, we're facing many challenges as a global community. And those challenges are very much global in nature. And as we, oh, as, we as can we hear? Is that okay? Just had an interruption. Okay. Yeah. We're good. Okay. Sorry, I'll carry on. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to say that we're facing many global challenges of a very much global nature at the moment. And these challenges fundamentally can't be tackled by nations alone. They are global challenges that require global solutions. Not only do we need global solutions, but we need global and regional financing, which is essential to really tackle these global challenges and ensure that the, the communities and institutions that are responding to them are well resourced to ensure that we manage the future success of people and the planet. And I'm really talking about these global challenges uh, around three C's that I'm, I'm going to focus on today to just set the scene as we get into our discussion. I'm talking about challenges such as climate, conflict and COVID. Now, none of these challenges are challenges that can be managed at a national level. So we do need to think about how do we address these challenges from a global perspective. So let's just take COVID as an example. Over the last two years, the pandemic has really challenged the world and it continues to challenge our health systems, our social and economic systems around the world. We're very much aware of the challenges of economic recovery post pandemic that we're all facing at the moment. COVID has triggered a real economic crisis with largely global poverty rising well above the rates we would have expected if we were here now without the pandemic having occurred. We're, we assume there'll be another 64 million people living in extreme poverty as a result simply of the pandemic. This will further be heightened by the consequences of the conflict we're seeing on, our, on uh, all around the world and the economic impacts those conflicts are having, further accentuating the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic as well. And then not to bring in the elements of, of climate change. Climate change is challenging us all, and we're seeing rising energy prices around the world as a result of the, the conflicts that we're seeing, but also the challenges of managing our own needs as a community and as human beings while facing the global climate crises as well. And amidst all of this, the financing institutions of the world have been really struggling on how to tackle these, uh, these particular global challenges. The financing institutions were set up back in the 40s and 50s in response to a world that was uh, emerging from the post Second World War. These institutions were really thinking about how they could respond to some of the um, urgent crises of rebuilding post-war, but also tackling some more of the humanitarian needs that come up. So they, were, they weren't thinking about developing a finance system that is really responsive to the world that we're living in today. However, the financing system hasn't changed substantially since it was created. And so we're seeing a major disconnect between the financial institutions that we have on one side and the global crises and challenges that we're facing today. So it's in this context that we really need to think about what do we need from our financial uh, institutions as we move forward. And never, the, uh, never before have we uh, understood the challenges we face. And one of the big areas that we face challenges around financing has been the sustainable development goals. We've been talking the first five years of the sustainable development goals from 2015 to 2020, we really spent a lot of time focusing on the financing gap. How are we gonna finance uh, these goals? And the financing gap was already quite significant. The recent crises, particularly with the pandemic, has only further widened this financing gap. So while the world is chasing, uh, changing fast around us, this triple nexus of conflict, COVID and climate really challenging us while we're also trying to implement a new agenda around the sustainable development goals. It's very clear that we need new, urgent, 
thinking around global financing systems that's going to actually provide solutions to the challenges we're facing. And this is where fundamentally global public investment comes in. It's a new ambitious financing framework appropriate for the post uh, SDG 2030 realities. It's a paradigm shift from the current realities of the world that we face today that is hugely dependent on the old aid architecture in particular. And our two panelists today who are joining us are going to take us through what global public investment is and they're going to actually uh, bring it to life for you all for the audience to really think about how can it tackle the challenges of the sustainable development goals now and also think about the world uh, the financing structure that we need in a post sdg world as well so let me firstly introduce our panelists and then i'll run through a few housekeeping things before we go into a, a bit of a q a with them and then I'm going to open it out to the audience as well to make sure we have some time for discussion from the audience. So firstly, we've got Jonathan Glennie with us. Jonathan Glennie is a writer, researcher and campaigner and consultant on sustainable development, inequality and poverty. His work's focused on changing nature of international co uh, cooperation as a dominant paradigm and global economic as global as I'm trying to read your bio, Jonathan, way too complicated, uh, as the changing nature of international cooperation has changed and global economic relationships have evolved. He's held many senior positions in several international institutions, including Ipsos, Save the Children, ODI and Christian Aid. He's been a writer with The Guardian's global development website, and he's also authored the book, The Future of Aid, Global Public Investment which has really set out the reality of what the global public investment could look like for the future. So thank you, Jonathan, for joining us today. And then we've got Martha, Martha Bickle, who is joining us from East Africa. She's based in Ethiopia. And um, just as a caveat, uh, Martha will turn off her camera because her broadband can be difficult, but we're going to definitely make sure she's online and can hear us for that reason. Now, Martha is the East African Regional Lead Analyst at Development Initiatives. She leads on our data-driven evidence component at the Africa Hub. Her background is in trade, human resources, and business economics. Martha's led a number of initiatives for development initiatives, but specifically tracking investments towards disaster risk reduction and climate change adaption in various African countries, including Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Tanzania. She's consolidated several risk sensitive investment studies into 16 African sub Saharan countries. And currently, she leads a team that tracks domestic resources towards certain critical sectors such as education, health, social protection, and external, uh, external finances towards African countries, particularly in the context of COVID. As I said, Martha's based in uh, Addis Ababa, so hopefully her, her broadband will stick and we should be able to have this conversation and she'll be able to hear us. So Martha, if you do want to turn your camera on off, that's not a problem at all. Um, we will make sure we can still hear you that way. So the way we will run the session is we will spend about 30 minutes having a conversation with Jonathan and Martha. And then I'm going to open up the conversation for the audience to be able to participate and I'd invite you to put your questions and thoughts and comments into the chat box. If we can, we will invite people to speak and bring their questions to, to, the, to, the, to the panel. But if we're struggling with audio, I will summarize your questions and put those to the panel for us today. We've got until, we've got an hour on this discussion. So without further ado, let's get started. So Jonathan, I'm gonna firstly turn over to you and just ask you the simple question about what is GPI and why is it important? Thanks, Harpinter. Can you hear me okay? We can, yeah. Great, well, thanks, thanks Harpinter. Thanks for the invitation to this meeting. Uh, so excited to be here. Um, to, to kind of talk about GPI really, especially in the current context, because you know things are changing so quickly all the time. And one of the one of the I guess exciting and interesting things about the GPI proposal is how it's taken kind of, I guess, it just got so much momentum behind it in the last couple of years. And that's undoubtedly because of COVID and the crisis um, that that has evoked. And of course, crisis some, can sometimes mean opportunity. And I think people have come to this GPI approach in a new way because it's more obvious than ever for some people that 
that we need some fundamental change in the way that we finance um, global public goods and our common global objectives. And that's fundamentally what, what GPI is. So you've set out uh, the challenges the world faces, um, and this is an attempt to respond to that. We know that we need um, lots of finance. You talked about the kind of first five years of financing the SDGs. And if we're honest, I think there was a heavy emphasis on bringing private money to the table, which I think is, of course, an important part of it, but it shouldn't have been associated with a de-emphasis on public money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think increasingly people are coming round to the realization that if we're going to fulfill our hugely ambitious SDG agenda, I mean, that 2015 moment will stand in history as a, it's, it's a wonderful moment. It's also kind of a daunting moment. Yeah. It's a hugely ambitious global agenda compared to the MTGs. It's global public goods, but it's not just global public goods. It's, it's much more ambitious, let's call them traditional development objectives, health, education, housing, um, all those things that matter so much in terms of bringing uh, convergence in the world to a, to a standard of living that's, that's right for the 21st century. Um, and we know that money matters for that. And we know that public money matters. So we need tons more international public money, which is not something that politicians always want to hear, but any analysts nowadays will tell you that. But we can't have it within the current constraints of the aid system. This is the, the global public investment model is not necessarily in the short term seeking to overturn aid, but it is a recognition that aid is, the aid and ODA architecture is limited. It's controlled in a particular way. It follows an us and them narrative, and that has implications both in terms of simply the, the, the patronizing nature of relationships and, and therefore also the accountability in those relationships. And what global public investment wants to do, and I'm going to kind of, you know, I'm not going to talk for too long, Harpenter, because it's, you know, it, I mean, I could just spend ages on this, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to be really brief, and then you can come back to me with, you know, the bits that I haven't said. But, but briefly, it says rather than an us and them way of working, where some countries are donors and some countries are recipients, this is the classic aid narrative. We're pushing for a world in which all countries contribute all countries benefit and therefore the governance is fundamentally different and all countries decide. And that sounds really radical. How can the poorest countries in the world contribute? Well, of course they're contributing a percentage of much smaller economies. So it is possible. And crucially, the impact of everyone being co-donors, co-contributors, is that the governance and accountability shift substantially. And we haven't mentioned, inevitably we're going to the current crisis in Europe, uh, with with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is which is tragic for its own sake, but it's also very worrying for the rest of the world because it means that Europe is now going to inward focus for a long time, and that means that concerns about the rest of the world inevitably diminish. So if 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 the if the global public financing system depends on the whims or rather the, the focuses and the priorities of a particular set of countries, that's a problem. So we need to shift to, to, a, to a situation where, where leadership and priorities and decision making is somewhat different. So we're proposing a new system um, called uh, global public investment, which, which, which does that. And crucially, I think uh, it's one in which it's one which will be co-created. So the Bretton Woods institutions, and you alluded to this, uh, were built by a handful of countries in, uh, in a post-war context, um, actually a hell of a lot easier uh, back in the day when you only had to get the five signatures on, the, on a piece of paper rather than 200. But it's totally un, really unacceptable that we still have that approach uh, today. And we need to have a system that is built by all countries, Latin Americans, Africans, Asians, as well as Europeans and North Americans. And it's a longer approach, it's harder, but it means that it will be built in a way that's appropriate for the 21st century. So the co-creation aspect of this is a, is a crucial part of it. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. So you're very much focusing on we need new additional funding, but it needs to be public funding. It's concessional finance. It's not based on repayments. And it has to be in a balanced new system of all contribute, all benefit, all decide. So that's really exciting. I'm going to move to Martha to sort of comment on why this idea, why this concept would be of relevance in Africa and what appeals about it. And, and how does it challenge some of the current methods of financing that are available to African countries at the moment? Thank you, Pim. Um, so I want to begin with acknowledgement that Africa is a collection of more than 50 countries, obviously, with uh, unique development challenges, priorities, 
uh, but we also recognize two thirds of uh, African countries which are in the UN list of least developed uh, countries. And equally important, we have common challenges. We can talk about disaster risk impacts, climate change, the pandemic continues to strain our health systems and infrastructure, as we said earlier. If you look at the vaccines rollout, we are talking about only 15% of Africans that are fully vaccinated, a quarter of the world average. So why do I think GPI uh, is important for Africa? Uh, the number one reason. It's a federal development finance system. We've, uh, we know that the Africa Development Bank estimated the, continents, uh, the continent required about 154 billion in 2020-21 to recover from the, to respond to the pandemic. And then we've all heard about the special drawing rights uh, of the IMF of the 165 billion. We got only 20%. And uh, in the words of the president of Democratic Republic of Congo, this uh, 33 billion special drawing rights allocated to Africa are insufficient and that uneven recovery risks deepening the gap between Africa and the rest of the world. So GPA recognizes these unique challenges. The other thing is for Africa, this also means financing can be aligned to needs of the countries and of African countries and the region. Um, in our recent study, for instance, in Ethiopia, we found that only 30% of external financing was having direct DRR objective uh, between 2015 and 2019. What I'm saying is GPI differs because it offers alignment to needs. And this is, of course, in line with the aspiration of Agenda 2063 for inclusive growth. What else? We have more and better money. Uh, GPI seeks to make more money easily accessible. I will give you an example. For instance, uh, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement both call for financial assistance to vulnerable countries. But currently, African countries are unable to meet the largest states, uh, uh, the target states uh, in their nationally determined contributions, what we call NDC. Uh, I can give you a figure for Kenya, for instance, where it raised uh, US uh, dollars 2.4 billion uh, in 2018, uh, which was approximately half of the financing the country had set for uh, as a target. What am I saying? GPI brings more and um, fresh money. The other thing is uh, increased voice and ownership for Africa. And this is very important um, to me and many Africans. We are at a time where there is an awakening in Africa. We have new bold leaders. We are in the middle of ratification of the Africa Continental Trade Area, AFCFTA. African leaders are increasingly expressing their displeasure on the current global cooperation where the continent plays second fiddle, ending up as either a pawn or victim as the Ghanaian president said some time back. The unfairness of the world system, which always goes back to the who holds to the strings of the purse is reflected even how we vote at the UN. We have seen recently how African countries do not want to be caught in the middle of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. We worry at the thought of the USA and its allies, its allies putting pressure on us because that would mean less money, less foreign aid, no invitations to the White House. <laughs> now, back to the public goods, what GPI proposes is all members will be equal partners in the provision of global public goods. GPI is creating a fair and just world. And finally, if you allow me, uh, Pin, mm -hmm. GPI is a compromising middle ground. As I said, we have new and bold leaders like the president of Ghana, uh, Akufo Addo, who said, we no longer want to offer the justification for those to be rude and abusive about Africa and her people. For this, he rejected aid by saying, no matter how generous the charity, we have remained poor. That is on the one, one hand. But on the other hand, we have the UN system where a country graduates once it reaches a certain income level. The reality is Africa lacks financial resources to build back better uh, from the pandemic, for instance, and for sustainable development goals in general. Yes. The end aid is attractive, 
but is it realistic? So this is where GPI comes in as a compromising middle ground. The fears of abuse is taken care of by a strong accountability architecture, uh, whereas no country graduates under GPI because there is this fundamental recognition that poverty and inequality exist in all countries, regardless of income levels. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pim. Yeah, no, that's great. That's fantastic, Martha. You talked about the importance of what GI, uh, GPA brings there, which is fairness, alignment to the priorities of the countries and their needs, and not being aligned to those who are donors and their political priorities, which I think is really important. The fact that this is new additional money, that point is coming out very loud and clear. Also ownership. I think the, when you raise the point about voice, that's about ownership. Those countries who are benefiting are actually owners of the process. They are not beneficiaries. That changes that language quite significantly. And with it, the power imbalances that sit within the current system. And then finally, you talked about accountability uh, and the importance of uh, accountability. And I will come back to that point around accountability because I think it's such an important point and it'd be great for us to explore that in a little bit more detail. But before we get there, I just want to sort of come back to Jonathan and ask him about whether there are institutions that are have the sort of mechanisms behind them, such as GPI, where there are countries that are all contributing, that are actually able to benefit, they may not be benefiting equally, but is there something where this is already working, where there is, uh, we can say that actually there, there may be some examples of how GPI could work so that it's not completely coming out of the blue. Yeah, thanks, Pin. And I think that, you know, um, much as I'd like to claim this is a sort of brand new, original, idea under the sun of course there's nothing new under the sun and all of these ideas are building on decades of scholarship uh, especially from the global south and also plenty of attempts to pilot this kind of thing um but, but one, of, one of the most obvious ones is the global fund um for aids um, malaria and tuberculosis which you know there's no perfect uh, system with no perfectly representative system but it certainly has a steering committee and governance which seeks to um represent more broadly including by the way civil society um and a private sector on on their board so um i also wanted just to kind of you know link, link your question to one that peter has asked in the chat about about where actually has AIDS ever been effective? Um, and that's a really good example of where it has. So the Global Fund, it's partly because of a good governance structure, it's partly because uh, the particular um, uh, focus of their work, which is vaccines, um, is, is one in which you can demonstrate impact somewhat more easily than some of the more complex um, political uh, change aspects of where AID has tried to work in the past, but I think one of the one of one of the fundamental, I guess, um, 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 kind of bases of the, of the GPI proposition is that you know public spending internationally does work; it can work. So at the moment, the option is kind of either you've got aid or you've got nothing. Whereas we're trying to say, look, it doesn't have to be aid. There are different ways of doing this. Um, so one area for a well, famous example where, where aid definitely did support development was South Korea uh, in the 70s. And it was a short term, high levels of aid. It wasn't the main reason why South Korea did well. It was a supplementary reason why South Korea did well. That's always crucial to understand. I lived in Colombia for a long time, and this is one of the main reasons why I got to understand the importance of, of, uh, of global public investment. Colombia doesn't receive large amounts of aid. It's a small amount of aid compared to the size of its economy. And yet it's a strategically um, spent, very specific kind of money. And what global public investment emphasizes is that it's not only the quantity that matters, the quantity does matter. But it's not only the quantity, it's the type of money um, and the importance that it's international, that it's public. Uh, which is a different kind of money to domestic public. It's a very different kind of money to private, whether international or domestic. So it does particular things. And that's how we have to understand it. We're not here at the, and the, and the aid narrative says, basically, and you talked about the kind of financing gap, it basically says there's a gap. And once it's filled by whatever money, whether it's domestic taxes, whether it's private money, it doesn't really matter whether it's the Gates Foundation, it doesn't really matter as long as it's money, because dollars are dollars. But that's just not true. 
Mm. Every different type of money has different types of characteristics and accountabilities. And global public money is different and it's special. It needs to be uh, looked after. And then with regard to accountability, yes, the, every, every type of spend has to be accountable. And this is a question that Sue asked in the, in the chat. Every type of money has to be accountable to someone. Otherwise, just anarchic. The question is, who is it accountable to? And the current system places far too much accountability to, let's call them Western donors, and far too little to co-accountability among uh, recipients. Let's say, because we're focusing on Africa, on the African continent, so it could be West African countries holding each other to account, and then working with the AU, and I know you'll come back and ask Martha more about this, she knows a hell of a lot more than I do, but you know, there, are, there is subsidiarity of accountability that can, that can be introduced into a global public uh, investment system. And the final point I'd just like to make, um, PIN, is, is a comparison with the European Union. Yeah. It's a limited comparison. There are very great differences with what is possible within effectively a club of countries in a particular region and what's possible at the regional, at the global level. But what you've got there is a large scale redistribution of, 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 of uh, public finances from wealthier countries in uh, the, 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 the region, Germany, France, to much poorer countries in the region, actually quite a lot of the time South Europe, Southern Europe, relatively very wealthy countries globally, but still poorer, and now of course Eastern Europe. Um, and that, you know, there are arguments about the effectiveness, is it? and then fundamentally it is hard to make the perfect use of any public spending, let alone international public spending. But there is a hell of a lot of evidence that it has supported development and progress in those countries, not poverty reduction, not just poverty reduction. And that's a really crucial part of the SDG agenda and of the GPI agenda. We're not just focused on poverty reduction. You know, once we've dealt with extreme poverty, that's when development begins. That's when convergence begins. That's when ending inequality begins. OK, so, so let's not limit our vision as the aid world does to, well, we've dealt with poverty, now we're off. This is about longer term convergence to acceptable standards of living. It's been tried in Europe, it's somewhat succeeded. Let's try it around the world. Great, Jonathan, thank you so much. I'm going to come back to that point around accountability with, for Martha to, to elaborate on a little bit, because I think Jonathan's covered a lot of questions that have been coming up in the chat as well, but the accountability one I think is really important and it touches on some of the questions we had earlier pre-session as well that have been coming in. And it's really about what does mutual or multiple accountability look like? And we, we've talked about accountability to the providers of the funding so in the aid context the traditional aid providers and them feeling they they're accountable to their populations uh, for the the tax that they provide that it contributes to the aid spend but actually when we look at accountability from a different perspective what does that look like and what would that mean and how can gpi address this issue of shared accountability and and really turn it on its head. What are, what are we looking at with regards to accountability and what would success look like from a GPI perspective? Not just success in the 0.7 uh, volumes perspective that the amount of money that's raised is classified as success. How can we actually uh, turn this around from a GPI perspective? Martha, I'd love to hear from you from a, an African perspective on that. Uh, yeah, how, in other words, you're asking me how GPI works at the regional level, I believe. And yes. I, I hate to disappoint you because none of us in this panel know the answer to that uh, as we continue to refine and co-create. But I have a few ideas, you know, and it starts from the co-creation, I believe, from that process. Uh, uh, so you have, for instance, when we are co-creating and refining GPI together, we are talking about all of us coming together, the African Union, different regional economic blocks or communities. We are talking about the African Development Bank, governments, African think tanks, uh, citizens. And what makes GPI so unique and interesting to me as an African is this is the first time in history that Africa will be fully part of a monetary and financial global system design from the start. Why I say this, and Pin, you touched on this uh, with your uh, opening remarks, uh, and you talked about the 1944 conference, the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference, which was a gathering of 44 uh, countries uh, in Britain, Woods, New Hampshire, yeah? Mm -hmm. And guess how many countries, African countries were in that conference? Only four, Ethiopia, Egypt, Liberia, and the, the then 
uh, Union of South Africa. Why the rest of where the rest of the countries were all colonized. So this is a conference that was uh, you know setting the rules for monetary systems. This will be the first time African countries will have full participation and full control of the process that we are proposing. So there is a chance to co-create. The other thing that I, I, I would see it is, of course, was Jonathan was speaking about the accountability. To whom are we accountable is the question. Right now, we are accountable to Washington, to Brussels, to Beijing, and so on. But as Jonathan was, uh, was saying, you know, here we, we will have two layers of accountability or two components of ac accountability. You have accountability to your citizens because you are talking about transferring fund uh, to transferring money, taxpayer money to the fund. So you have to be accountable to your citizens. And then you have to be accountable to your neighboring countries or uh, countries within the region to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then uh, what else? So as we as we build on, and uh, we, we talked about some mechanism mechanisms that are existing. Of course, we need to take stock of how uh, that works and what we can learn from GPI. But for instance, you have the Kigali decision on financing of the African Union, where member states are expected to contribute zero point two percent import levy to finance the African Union for financial autonomy. Okay, so this is a good example. Of course, it has its own problem because uh, the last report I read, for instance, uh, it said only 17 countries out of 55 member states were uh, collecting uh, from the levy. And uh, one of the lessons for us can be, um, uh, it can be that there needs to be an uh, enforcement mechanism for this. Uh, so this is about decolonizing aid, but you can only do that when there is uh, that fundamental uh, strong accountability mechanism. And the custodians can be regional bodies, it can be, you know, like African Union or African Bank, but these are things that we need to flesh out together. And this is not something that we can decide in a panel discussion. Yeah. No, I think that's a really important point. Um, uh, Martha, is that this is very much at a place where we need to be co-creating those governance mechanisms and how it will work and how we can make it a, a tangible uh, mechanism that funding can then flow through as well. And so it leads me to sort of a thought. I've got some questions coming in, which I'm going to come to in a minute around governance issues. But Martha, could you comment on the feedback you've had from the African continent. I know you've been leading some consultations and also having some meetings uh, around what does this mean for the SDGs in Africa? And I'd love to hear a little bit more from the feedback you're getting. Where are, where are the areas of excitement, but also where are the potential areas that are actually barriers for this idea to be taken up as mm. well, Paige? Yeah, thank you, P. I mean, I can tell you with the consultations that we had, Everyone agrees about the failures of the current financial system. Everyone is excited. Africans are excited about decolonizing uh, aid or the financial system in general. But of course, uh, there are certain barriers that we are anticipating. For instance, there will likely be pushback from certain quarters, uh, including governments, because what are we saying? We are saying all contribute, meaning that we are used to the old ways of getting money uh, we are not contributing. So there may be that resistance uh, for sure. The other thing is, this is a matter of uh, legitimacy. Why I say this is that when you are bringing in the voices of citizens and more participation and uh, uh, representation of experts and civil societies, sometimes it, it is a bit uh, difficult, this part of the world, you know, because it, it now becomes a question of legitimacy. Uh, the other thing, of course, uh, we've been discussing even during the consultation is governance and politics around aid. Uh, it, it's going to be very challenging, definitely. So how do we occupy that political space? Um, moving from individual champions to governments and regional bodies like the AU, UNECA, current donors and recipients and so on. This is definitely short -term, uh, a short-term challenge but we need to really uh, spend time 
on this. And finally, um, there are people uh, who would prefer we fix the broken system instead of creating a new one, because really GPI seems to be too ambitious for some people. And yes, GPA is grand, GPA is ambitious, which may put off some people, but it is surmountable. Yeah. Thank you, Pim. That's great. That's a good point. I'm going to ask that same question back to Jonathan, actually, uh, around where are the exciting areas, which I think we know more about, but also where are the barriers that you're seeing outside of the African continent as well? And are they different to the ones Martha has highlighted? Um, yeah, I mean, just before I answer that, just to build on what Martha was saying about feedback from the African continent, one of the one of the areas of the proposal is that actually all countries can benefit, which also sounds incredibly radical. In other words, why why on earth would you know Europe and wealthier countries will be benefiting from this money give, given so many um, you know much much more needy situations? Actually, it's really really popular aspect of the proposal in when I speak to African uh, civil society and governments and also other parts of the global south, because you know the money is important, right? You know we know that the material stuff matters a lot, but the psychology matters so much as well. And I think you know there's so much focus, isn't there, on impact and results and can you count exactly how many people of X, Y, and Z did? And we've all done it, and it's not unimportant but it takes us away from some really profound issues of dignity and respect that matter a lot to people. We know in our own lives, you know, dignity matters as much as my income. You know, people resign, even though they've got well-paid jobs because they get treated badly. That's just a kind of very personal uh, example. It matters in global relationships as well. And what people in the global South love is the idea that actually Northern countries can also be recipients of, of support and actually need help. That's one of the things the SDGs does as well. It, you know, if the MDG says the problem was poverty and that's in the global South, the SDG says the problem is unsustainable development. And that is as much a problem in the global North as it is in the global South. Inequality is much of a problem everywhere. Um, so, so, so the global public investment proposal is very much building on this huge paradigm shift that came with the SDGs, which is a massive step forward in our understanding of, um, of, of global relationships. Now I'm going to answer your question very quickly. And fundamentally, it's about incentives, isn't it? It's, it's like, why on earth, how the hell are you going to persuade the countries that currently have power, be they the West, be they China, to engage in a multilateral system where effectively what we're asking them to do is, is to hand over power? Now, that is the fundamental strategic question that we're going to have to be dealing with over the next five, 10 years as we work up to the 2030 moment, which we think is going to be a, an opportunity for uh, this, this kind of new financing system to be implemented, obviously, you know, built over time. Um, and yeah, it's going, to, it's going to be hard, right? There is, it's quite obvious, I think, why some uh, upper middle income countries might like the idea. Low income countries might be nervous about it uh, because they might be worried about um, some financing streams, but they might be really excited about it because it gives more power and decision if, as long as they can be guaranteed, hopefully increasing financing uh, streams with, with less of the, of the unhelpful conditionality uh, that so often accompanies it and the, and the whim uh, uh, that so often um, accompanies accompanies it, but fundamentally the question is, you know, it, China currently is operating in just just to use, uh, you know, that, that example is operating in a very free way around the world. We would be proposing that it somewhat comes under a system. Um, the West also, while at moments has sought to improve its effectiveness. Um, and that has meant handing over ownership. I think there's recognition in the research is something I always emphasize, you know, this, this kind of money works best when there is delegated power, when there is ownership um, uh, in, the, in the recipient uh, communities and countries. Um, but ultimately, especially in this geopolitics where, there's, where, there, where there is battling for positions, how are we gonna persuade uh, the US and, and Europe and China to, to engage in multilateralism in this very serious way? Well, I think there's an opening, I think there's a possibility, but it's, you know, it's far from certain. And I think we just have to kind of, firstly have a really clear proposal, uh, which I think we're getting. I think we then have to take advantage of the political uh, windows of opportunity that emerge 
uh, and just keep on pushing for this. Um, and ultimately, like I say, it is going to come down to can we persuade uh, the, the powerful parts of the world that it's in their own interests um, to, to, to join in this multilateral frame and to somewhat devolve power over how money is spent, even their own money. Um, and I think that's going to depend on evidence, but ultimately it's going to be, depend on politics. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Not an insurmountable challenge. I'm going to turn to a couple of our questions uh, that have come in while we've been talking about the last issue. One is around addressing the governance issues in a lot of recipient uh, countries. So how does GPI address governance issues in, in recipient countries? In particular, how does it deal with the challenge of corruption when it comes to spending funds? And then there's a follow up from that same person on how does the system ensure egality in decision making power if countries contribute different amounts? So that goes back to the point of actually, uh, can the person who's putting in the smallest amount still have an equal voice at the table around decision making and, and, and does power reside with what you put in? which is obviously how a lot of the existing institutions are, are set up as well. So I'm going to open that up to whoever wants to go first, and, th and then I'll come back to the next question. Mm, I can go first, at yeah. least the cor corruption aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Of course, we've been, we've been asking, you know, if foreign aid really is as effective as we think, because sometimes, especially in Africa, we find ourselves uh, observing that foreign aid is enabling dictators and human rights abusers, you know, as long as they are dancing to the tune of donors. Mm -hmm. uh, not always, but there are cases. Uh, but the GPI thinking is that there can be a layer that can be added, for instance, in terms of penalties agreed across member states for misappropriation. Uh, so this would enhance uh, accountability and tightening the accountability mechanism. Uh, but I would also really challenge us because we are so used to holding the powerless more accountable than the powerful. Uh, so I, I, I would really want us, I want to challenge us because um, I, I can equally ask like for instance of existing uh, financial institutions how many have, or how strong is it, if it exists, um, having an ombudsman to hold it accountable? Are there complaints that are publicly available? Are we doing harm, for instance? Where are complaints stored? Are they publicly available and so on? So uh, it, this is something also for, for thoughts. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, Martha. Very, very strong. How do we hold the powerful accountable as well as the powerless? I love that. I think that's a really uh, important question for all of us. Jonathan. Yeah, so just, just building on that, I, I, I fully agree. And uh, I, I always remember I looked at the um, uh, Transparency International um, ratings last year. I think Italy is down there below Ghana in, in um, kind of perceptions of corruption. So, I mean, the, the sad thing is, the sad truth is that corruption is, it's an endemic problem. It could be just a problem that humanity has to deal with always. I, I think I used to think that, that gradually we'd improve. And I just think possibly that's not true. If you look at, um, yeah, and you have to be naive to look at the US and think there wasn't deep corruption in politics. Um, I don't know how much was spent in our, in, in, I'm mean, here in the UK, in, the, in our tra tra track and trace system, it was billions spent and no one knows really what it was spent on. And I'm not necessarily saying it was corrupt, it was certainly crazy the amount of, of, of lost money um, going round. So um, the, other, the other thing is, you know, there are many corrupt countries, and this sounds really annoying to people, but, you know, that are doing really well. I mean, China is the most obvious example. So corruption can be a terrible thing and usually is. And especially because it doesn't mean that money is being directed correctly, but it's but it's kind of um, a problem that I think we're going to have to work with um, over the very long term. And it's not true that it's the job of the West to hold the rest of the world. Um, it's not it's not their job. And also they're not the competent agency to hold the rest of the world um, accountable for corruption. Um, partly because of what Martha said, partly just because it's not the way that it works. It's just as likely, and I think this is the answer to the question in, in concrete terms from me, it's, it's just as likely that sub-national approaches to hold the powerful um, accountable, um, that 
that um, peer to peer approaches at the sub regional and regional level to hold other governments accountable, that regional uh, approaches at the continental level, complemented by international approaches all together, will do a better job over time of at least managing corruption let's not be i think over optimistic that somehow we're going to end corruption in human politics but certainly um managing it better i think that is as much bottom up as it is top down the idea that you know we need boris johnson and the british government to tell countries when they're being corrupt or not i think is is probably a bit 20th century and then with regard to with regard to the question about how do you have equality in in decision making of course the answer is you can't power is power, you know, the World Trade Organization has a, a, a one member, one vote rule. It doesn't mean that Bolivia is as powerful as France, um, but what institutions do is somewhat mitigate power. So you can't get away from the fact that powerful countries and richer countries will dominate, but you can set up institutions that enable as best we can um, less powerful voices to emerge and have a seat at the table. And that's what the EU has done. Yeah, everyone knows that, that, that Germany and France dominate the budget um, talks and nothing's going to go through ultimately without Germany and France saying so. But Romania's at the table. Yeah, and it's sitting there and it's doing its best to, to make its case. And that's fundamentally different from how currently aid operates, where there's no recipients significantly at the table. Uh, it's all decided in donor countries and in Western um, based international institutions, which are not, you know, terrible in mean, the World Bank has a system of trying to respond to member needs. And at the regional level, uh, you know, actually development banks are much better. So there are examples of, of where this is already beginning to happen. Um, but fundamentally, the Washington institutions are pretty much controlled by Washington and Europe, and we can do a lot better. I don't think I'm holding out for some kind of perfect system here. I think that would be foolish, but we can do a lot better than we are at the moment. And that's what the GPI approach is setting out to do. Thanks, Jonathan. I think it's really important to highlight that the GPI isn't trying to address every single problem um, that we, we understand and know of. It's, it's very specifically ta tackling the challenges of um, increasing concessional finance and also uh, looking at actually how that goes to the right places and also benefits more people but the people who are also benefiting are also the ones who are accountable for the impacts that funding is having as well so those elements are really crucial to gpa yes there's a lot of other challenges and there's been quite a few comments around some of those challenges in in the chat as well which i won't i won't highlight here but i think they're all very very important because some of them are actually saying look we're talking about changing behavior of global institutions how does GPI change that? And I and I think to some degree we can come back to that uh, uh, with GPI. And is there an opportunity by changing the way finance is is mobilised and the way it's delivered and the way it it is then um, uh, judged as being successful? Can that change behaviours of global institutions? So that's one question. But there's also a second question, which I'm going to put to you because we're nearing the sort of the last few minutes of our, our um, time. And I'm just going to wrap some of them up, if I may, to both Jonathan and Martha. And the second question is around, um, does GPI potentially offer the ability to be a different measure of, of wealth and success and economic impact. So it's challenging the GPD, the, the gross domestic project uh, measure that is currently used as a measure of success for countries. And, and the question is, can GPA introduce more advanced thinking on measuring success according to population impact rather than GP, GP, GDP increases? Sorry, I'm getting my Gs and Ps mixed up here. Jonathan, do you want to start on that? And we'll come to Martha afterwards. So um, I think, you know, the struggle to kind of move on from GDP is the ultimate uh, measure. You know, everyone uses that famous Bobby Kennedy quote. I mean, you know, this has been going on for decades. And I think we, we're getting there. I actually think that the SDG um, moment, it, it was a really big deal in that, but partly because it moved us on, not, not necessarily from GDP, but certainly from the kind of extreme poverty focus, which I think has equally been at the same time incredibly important and understandable, 
also very limiting in our understanding of what the role of global public uh, financing can be and fundamentally what international cooperation is about and I've, I've said it already but this time I'll, I'll give I'll give the man his um, citation it was Adolf Krokelesch that used to run the, the German uh, aid agency who said who said once um, ending poverty is when development begins I just thought that was great because it turns it all turns everything I was always taught on its head which is you know our job is to end poverty and then we pack up and go away and he was like no when we when, when, when the world has succeeded in in reducing poverty to the very low extreme poverty as defined to, to these very low limits that's when development really begins that's when progress can really take, take off and that's when international cooperation absolutely has a place so i think when if the question is can gpi help change global institutions it certainly can change, help change that mindset and i think it's related also to the all decide thing so so one so the question is how does how does gpi operate in reality i think there was a huge subsidi subsidi subsidiarity um play a role whereby you know in the different regions there is a great um, prioritization of, of limited financing but also at the international level there has to be some agreement about what the focus areas are for global public investment and that could take place every three years or every five years a broad a broad um, direction of travel the sdgs have done that it's way too um broad and so there needs to be a more significant prioritization of particular funds. Um, but, but as long as the right people are around that table, then it could be not so focused on GDP. It could be not so focused on specific uh, elements of extreme poverty. Um, although that will always remain, I think, the number one priority. And so as always, um, it's about who is at the table to help make those decisions. And, 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 and the SDGs was an example of where really the global south took the lead and won a battle to broaden the scope of global cooperation. I think if that if that direction continues, then yeah, we could see change in this way that, that the question implies. Thank you. And uh, Martha, do you want to come in? Yeah, uh, I mean, jo Jonathan has covered uh, everything. It's just to add that, uh, and uh, Jean, as you said, you know, it's about culture. How do you change? We're talking about 80 years, close to 80 years of this financial system. How do you change that culture? Because we are talking about political and economic reforms uh, in this international cooperation. So it will take time, definitely. It, 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 it is difficult, but it is something that, that can be done. The other thing I wanted to address, uh, Pim, because you kept asking about how does success look like? Maybe one indicator, I don't know, but one indicator can be, uh, you know, the aspect of localization, the localization agenda it has, because now you are bringing in countries that know their priorities, that can identify their needs, and they can address them. So that localization agenda element can is pronounced in GPI, and it can be used as one indicator. The other could be also who is setting your priorities, who is setting the measurements, as I said. Whom are you accountable to? And who, are, who is setting the objectives? And this is what GPI offers. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Martha. We, we're in the last sort of few minutes of our conversation. And so I'm gonna actually start to get us to wrap it up if we can, so that we can finish on time. Um, there's multiple events running uh, today throughout the Skull uh, virtual day. Um, so my, I'm going to come back to both of you just to provide a, a, a sort of a short summary of one key takeaway that you'd like the audience to take away from today's discussion that would be really helpful from your perspective of what's what's important about GPI and what's next and how can our in uh, audience also engage with this uh, this concept and take it forward with us as well because we've talked a lot about co-creation and how it's important and also we're at the very the early stages of getting this idea out there's a lot of work to be done the more partners the more supporters we can bring in to challenge the thinking but also to then take it forward and champion it and test it in different places is really critical so for, for me I always think of how do we create the space to actually bring more people on, on board as well and take them with us. So I'm gonna to turn to Martha first to just give us her key takeaways from this discussion and then I'll come to Jonathan. 
Thank you, Pin. Definitely, I would also want to emphasize on the co-creation, the socialization of these principles. And I, I, I want to take us back to what happened last month at the eighth session of the African Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. Um, and African ministers and senior officials have already noted the needs for scaled up and sustainable finances for an inclusive recovery from the COVID-19 crisis and accelerated delivery uh, of sustainable development in Africa. So what I want to say to my fellow Africans is it is time for African development practitioners, policymakers, African scholars, Pan-African institutions, and all other stakeholders, including myself and organizationally present development initiatives to come together to co-create the GPI concept. Together, we need to explore the viability of GPI, its governance system and accountability mechanisms to make it an African model under the general GPI principle that is owned by us Africans and that works for us. What I'm saying is not simple, I know. This is complex. Let us give ourselves time because we need time to flesh this out. Let us give ourselves time in readiness for the realities of 20. 30. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. A great way to uh, wrap yeah. up everything. Jonathan. Yeah, it's so well put, uh, Martha. Um, I, I guess I guess the one kind of, I guess, po po political strategic comment uh, I would make is that, you know, GPI does say, the GPI approach does say we need to transform the aid model. Yeah, it's not sufficient for the 2020s, 2030s and 2040s. So that is going to need to change. But, you know, transforming a really well established model is hard and it's controversial. And that will take a lot of debate and discussion politically. The one area where everyone agrees we need a significant institutionalization of an approach and where global public investment principles can absolutely be the basis is responding to global public goods. Yeah, everyone agrees that that is uh, disorganized at the moment, insufficient, not working well. And it makes absolute sense for GPI to be the base of that. So that's, that's, that's actually the easier win to work on first. That's just that's just kind of, you know, I guess a strategic point. And the, and the second point I just wanted to build on, you know, Martha's great summary there, focusing on Africa, of course, you know, the same is true for the other regions. And she said it's not simple. And that's certainly true. I would also just say it's not cheap. And so if you're asking me, I know this is a really tedious point to make, but if you're asking me what I think people, you know, can do to help support, you know, absolutely engage. But it's not cheap. It takes time and effort and resources. And so if people are inspired by this idea and think it can work, then I do think, you know, think about how your organization can support with resources, whether you're a funder with cash or whether you're an organization that can put it into your strategy and become part of the GPI network, which is going to be, which I should probably mention, which is going to be kind of, I guess, launching in the next month or so, uh, whereby, you know, those organizations that want to work on GPI strategically can get together and discuss how to uh, develop the concept, co-create the concept and actually start to um, implement it as uh, and do advocacy around it. So, yeah, resources and uh, that kind of support. Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan. So very much in summary uh, to this meeting, GPI is very much about setting a new paradigm shift in the way that we do development finance. It's about putting the tenants around all contributing, all benefiting, all deciding. And then there's a fourth element that's starting to come in about this shared accountability around it as well. And that's fantastic. So this is also about bringing in more funding for some of those global challenges that must be tackled at the global or regional levels and need all of us to be working on them and they cannot be left in uh, left for further generations to deal with because they are so pertinent for us to tackle today and then the global public uh, the global public investment network is going to be launched soon so that's something for all of our audience to look out for and be aware of hopefully we'll be able to share more information about that soon in the meantime, there are a couple of links that have been popped in the chat as well of blogs and other uh, places that you can go to get more information about global public goods. So hopefully, please take those links away and make sure you learn more. We're very keen to expand the network to do this thinking together, but also do the co-creation elements together as a community, particularly in different regions, because this has to be taken forward 
in the regions where it really matters. So it's really a call out to everybody to get involved, to learn more, but also to bring yourselves and some resources to the table so we can take this forward. Thank you very much, everyone, for a great discussion. Thank you so much to Martha and to Jonathan for providing such insightful thoughts today. I hope everyone's enjoyed it and we look forward to connecting and continuing as we go forward. Have a good afternoon, morning or evening, wherever you may be.